Welcome to Smash Metafiction, the side project of Smash Fiction where we put aside our differences and work not to pit characters against each other, but to unite them together in search of a common goal. This week, we're saving the world from both corporate greed and cosmic destruction in the fourth episode of Surprise Party. The mega corporation called the Shinra Electric Power Company has become the single most influential and powerful organization in the world, thanks to their exploitation of the life stream, the collective vital energy of the planet Gaia, and all living things on it. Shinra uses complex machinery to extract and refine life stream into a usable substance called Mako, which powers their cities and weapons and allows them to create magic producing crystals called Materia. Not only has this allowed Shinra to establish a dystopian nation-state in which they rule over an oppressed lower class, their constant mining of the lifestream is doing real, lasting damage to all life on the planet. A group of environmentally-minded freedom fighters called Avalanche has risen in the slums of the city of Midgar, intending to bring down Shinra in order to elevate the lower class and save Gaia. But little do they know that their journey will bring them into conflict with a powerful warrior long thought dead, whose insane goal involves using forbidden magic to bring about a global apocalypse. Yikes! <laughs> I certainly hope that this avalanche group has some top-notch heroes on its payroll, because it's gonna need them. I'm Dan Mulcairin, and though I've been wrapped in a Mako cocoon in the North Crater for years, I've sent my mind-controlled clones across the world in order to host and judge this episode. <laughs> Joining me is Claire Mulcairin. Hello! Megan Bob. Kit's not here, but I did bring one character that can't talk, so I'm repping. <laughs> and Miles Schneiderman. I'm really excited to be doing a uh, surprise party episode in the um, Final Empire fantasy setting. I'm a, I'm a big fan of Mistborn. Um, and I think, <laughs> jeez. Wait, why are you laughing? <laughs> oh, Miles, you sweet summer child. <laughs> A quick rundown for those who haven't heard an episode of Surprise Party before. We're taking a classic team-centric story, in this case, Final Fantasy VII, and we are replacing the central characters with other fictional characters. Each of the other hosts will create their own party to go up against the monsters, mecha, and minigames of this story. Once each of them have their teams created, I'll present them with challenges that they encounter along the way. The players will take turns choosing a character from their team and explain how they deal with that challenge. After that point, that chosen character is unusable for the remainder of the game. At the end of each challenge, I'll decide privately which character met the challenge the best and award points to the players accordingly, then we'll move on. At the end of the game when Sephiroth is defeated and the planet is saved, I'll see which player had the most points and they and their party will be declared the winner. So first off, let's choose your characters, and in order to do that we're going to be rolling initiative, so please give me those 20-sided dice. That, ladies and gentlemen, is a natural one. <laughs> nice. <laughs> I rolled a six. And Megan Bob? I got a nine. Okay. <laughs> High score. With, with no <laughs> double digits on the board, nice. the order will be Megan Bob, Claire, and Miles, but this order will be rotating every round. The first character slot each of you will be filling is the sword. This is likely to be your party's frontline character, as they are capable of both taking and dishing out a great deal of punishment. The sword may not have the same flexible repertoire of techniques and abilities that the other characters have, but they are solid, reliable, and always physically powerful. Megan Bob, who is your sword? I chose Kenpachi Zidaki from Bleach. Okay, I have never watched Bleach, so you will have to explain this to me. I have, but then I wanted to put the substance of the same name <laughs> into my eyes. <laughs> he is a sword-using crazy man. Very strong. <laughs> he actually does things to make fighting harder for himself because he doesn't like it when it's not challenging enough. So that's kind of tells you what he's like. Oh, okay. That sounds great. And he has a little pink person that rides around on his shoulder. Yeah, sounds like he belongs right in Final Fantasy. Claire, who is your sword? My sword is actually a shovel. It's Shovel Knight. I see. Shovel Knight is from the game of the same name. He is a practitioner of the ancient code of chivalry. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he, That's uh, delightful. He wears blue armor. He is very honorable and upright. And he's a bit of a guy from like a sort of an old forgotten age, but is still very noble. People underestimate him because he fights with a shovel, but then he kicks your ass because he's really good with a shovel. All right. <laughs> Sounds great. I'm in love. 
Miles, who is your sword? My sword is Jaquita Wagner from Planetary. Very good choice. Tell us about Jaquita. Oh, man. All right. So Jaquita is the daughter of what is referred to in the Planetary universe as Century Babies, which are superhuman people born on January 1st, 1900. They are near immortal and they all have special powers. She's the daughter of one of these guys. And also a really intelligent African lady. Her powers have manifested in the form of just, like, extreme strength, speed, durability. She is physically superhuman in every way, and she has an extremely low tolerance for boredom. She is terrific and a very good choice for your story. She's the best. The next character slot is the gun. This is the character who typically engages enemies at a distance using some sort of ranged weapon, whether that weapon is a pistol or rifle, a bow and arrow, a thrown weapon, or even more exotic means. But this character isn't just about sniping from a distance. Because of their unique perspective on a battle, the gun can often help benefit the team by employing tactical and strategic skills, helping to guide their friends through unpredictable and dangerous circumstances. Claire, who is your gun? My gun is Jack from Jack and Daxter. Nice. Tell us about Jack. And I'd like it to be Jack and Daxter if possible. I want to have Daxter Mm -hmm. hanging around if I can get away with that. I think that's acceptable, but why don't you tell us all about him? Jack is a dude from Jack and Daxter. In the first game, he's a sort of non-speaking, stoic, personality-less protagonist. And then he gets captured by a bunch of bad guys at the start of a second game and gets it tortured and experimented on with dark magic. He breaks out of captivity and decides he doesn't want to be a silent protagonist anymore and starts talking and starts being a badass and kicking butt. (laughs) And he has dark energy magic powers. And then he softens a little bit in the third game and gets light magic powers too. And now he kind of has both elements to his character. And by the end, he's sort of like a a fairly well-rounded hero savior of the world guy. And he has a sassy little guy who's a orange weasel man who rides on his shoulder, who's his friend (laughs) named Daxter, who used to be a human who he's trying to find a way to turn human again. And he also cruises around on a flying skateboard. It's his hoverboard. And he has a gun called the morph gun that can turn into 12 different types of gun. So, nice. <laughs> nice. so like, basically, this is your combination of Barrett and Cat Sith in this game. Basically, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Miles, who is your gun? My gun is schizophrenic character number one of two for this party. My oh gun my is Susanna Dean of the Dark Tower series. Oh, nice. Okay. <laughs> she's a good gun. <laughs> That's yeah. a very good gun. Tell us about Susanna. Well, she's a gunslinger, in fact. Susanna is a... Really awesome character. She's a handicapped black lady who uh, lost her legs from the knees down when she was a kid. And she was pulled into a place called Midworld out of her native 1960s America by Roland Deschain, the titular gunslinger of the series. And uh, trained by him to be really fucking awesome with a gun. In addition to that, she is a master of tactics and strategy. Her handicap does not impair her in the least. In combat. Uh, she also has a separate personality. Oh, yeah. About that, the schizophrenic part. Uh, so, yes, she is actually the composite personality of her two original personalities, which were Odetta Holmes and Detta Walker. Odetta Holmes being a rich socialite and Detta Walker being a psycho person. <laughs> um, she... Doesn't usually call on Odetta, but Detta shows up somewhat frequently to yes. to say right. snarky things and be a badass. I would have lost money if I had actually bet on who I thought you were going to choose for your gun character. <laughs> who did you okay. think it was going to be? I thought it was going to be Cyclops for sure. Oh, well, you know. Megan Bob, who is your gun? I chose Captain America. Nice. He doesn't have to do ranged, but he does have the ability to do ranged, True. and he's real good at tactics. True. Yeah, he I absolutely mean, fits. Uh, you want to tell us a little bit about him? You know, uh, Captain, Captain America. I know. I was like, he's a sad man who lived as an ice cube for a while. <laughs> what do you want to know? <laughs> I would love a book that's just your interpretations of different, like, comic book characters. I think that would be delightful. <laughs> it's just a drawing of an ice cube with a sad face on it. <laughs> uh, do you have a preference as to whether you're using a comic cap or MCU cap? I think it's going to have to be MCU. I know a little bit about him from the comics, but honestly, oh. the one I know the most about is from Alien. Go with, go with MCU. Comics cap yeah, sucks. MCU that, cap is great. Yeah. The third character slot is The Fist. This is a fast and agile character who, through some combination of skill, accuracy, and pure physical might, is capable of landing devastating blows. This character would prefer to evade enemy attacks rather than soaking them up, as they aren't typically quite as robust or armored as some of the other characters, but their mobility and finesse more than make up for it. Miles, who is your fist? (laughs) Uh, 
So you you might have lost money on the last one, but hopefully you'll you'll gain money on this one if you uh-huh. uh, place the right mm-hmm. bet. Don't do it. So my fist is Prince Puma from what? from the television show Lucha Underground. Okay, oh all right. <laughs> the character is portrayed by Trevor Mann, the professional wrestler who usually goes by the name of Ricochet, but in Lucha Underground, he's Prince Puma. Prince Puma is a descendant of one of the seven ancient Aztec tribes. Specifically, he is a descendant of the Jaguar tribe. He's kind of like a chosen one character in Lucha Underground. He doesn't have as like explicit supernatural powers as some of the other characters in that show. He is seen like performing great feats of strength, like punching right through a punching bag and stuff like that. But he is a supernatural character and he is portrayed as such because the actual human being Trevor Mann is a ridiculous human being who can do (laughs) things that nobody should be able to do. So lots of flips, lots of uh, jumping high flying moves that deliver great impact over great distances, lots of kind of dodging, weaving, flipping, jumping. And while he is certainly tough he might not be as tough as like the toughest pro wrestlers you know honestly i'm just surprised that we've gotten four episodes into surprise party and this is the first time we've had a professional <laughs> yeah, this is only my us. second so <laughs> that's true <laughs> megan bob who is your fist i went with river tam nice. Oh, nice she's been on smash fiction before but uh give us a little bit of a rundown of river from firefly and serenity she is a tiny waif uh, who goes around barefoot and then hits a lot of things. She's on the run from the law and has a lot of emotional and mental distress. Sure. Also has some uh, psychic abilities as well. She can kill you with your brain, I hear. Claire, who is your fist? My fist is Wreck-It Ralph. Oh, oh terrific. Tell I mean, us about Wreck-It Ralph. When, when you need some giant fists. Yeah, dude. Who's, who's gonna wreck it? <laughs> yeah. So Wreck-It Ralph is the villain from the arcade game Fix-It Felix Jr. from within the universe of the film Wreck-It Ralph. Basically, it's his job, because he's a character in a video game, to wreck this building every day. And then the hero, Fix-It Felix, comes around and fixes the building. And then he gets a medal. And everybody loves Felix. And everybody hates Ralph. Because he breaks the building every day. But that's his job, because he's a villain in a video game. And he gets upset about this and decides to go on a quest of self-discovery. He's a giant guy with giant fists. He's good at wrecking things. He has a sort of villainy exterior, and he can be a little gruff sometimes. But on the inside, he wants to be a good guy. Very good. The fourth character slot is the staff. The staff primarily focuses on magic or some other type of mystical power. Whether that power comes from sorcery, a divine patron, psionics, or a straight-up superpower... This character is able to pull out a wide range of world-changing, physics-breaking effects. Megan Bob, who is your staff? I chose Mary Poppins. (laughs) Oh, no! We're all fucked! Awesome. Tell us about Mary Poppins. She's a nanny with the power of flight. And also to, like, take people into alternate dimensions and to make medicine not taste like shit. And then also <laughs> to warm the heart of an old cranky capitalist. Uh, also, very good. anytime she runs into a monster, like she'll be able to calm it down because it's just going to go, oh, I'm sorry, Mary, I didn't mean to make a fuss. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Yay, Miles Cockney accent. I will say that the Gameable podcast back when they were the Gameable Disney podcast did a very good episode on Mary Poppins in which they posited a very logically consistent argument that Mary Poppins was in fact a time lord. Oh yeah, absolutely. She and the Frizz are in a relationship. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Claire, who is your staff? My staff is going to be Sakura from Card Captors. Oh Aww. man, there's a show I haven't thought about in a long time. Tell us about Sakura. Um, so Card Captors Miles is an anime. It's about oh, okay. a girl named Sakura. She accidentally opens this magic book that was sealed that had these cards inside of it called the Clow Cards. The cards all come to life and like turn into monsters and scatter around the city. And she gets a little magic staff and a little cat friend who is like a beast who was supposed to be the guardian of the book. And they have to go on a quest to capture all the monsters and turn them back into cards. And once she's turned a monster back into a card, she can then use its abilities. She can hit it with her staff and then it gets summoned and it can do a thing. Like she has, for instance, a card which can summon a bunch of wind. She has a card which can summon a sword. She has a card which can make a duplicate of another person. She has a card which can, like, mess with time. Over the course of it, she keeps getting all these different powers, and by the end, she has 52 of them. Nice. All right. Miles, who is your staff? 
Oh man, this was hard. I was really hoping Kit was going to be on this episode because I was going to go with Doom, but, <laughs> but she's not, which means I can't annoy her with that selection. So what's the point? You could annoy Claire with it. Yeah, it's not the same without both. Of them have, have you just like have you been annoying me enough with all the uh, recent Sucker Punch references? Or, <laughs> yeah, I think, that well I think maybe I'll uh, I've I've gone enough on you, or have I? At least you didn't pick fucking baby doll for your sword. <laughs> <laughs> My staff is the Morrigan from The Wicked and the Divine. Oh, so cool. I had a feeling we might be seeing some Wick Div in the mix here. Uh, yeah. Tell us about the Morrigan. The Morrigan is a member of the Pantheon, which are, uh, in the world of The Wicked and the Divine, they are 12 young people who basically become gods from mythology every 90 years. They show up, they become celebrities, everybody loves them, and they do concerts and shit, and they have cool powers, and then after two years, they die. No one knows why. The series is not yet finished, so i um, still waiting on some revelations there. But the Morgan is a young woman who was infused with the spirit of the Celtic goddess of war and death. She has three distinct personalities. This is schizophrenic character number two of two. <laughs> there's the regular, the Morgan, which is kind of who she is normally. And then there's... And I think I'm pronouncing this right. I don't know for sure, but I believe the way to pronounce the name of one of her personas is Bav. Yep. She suddenly gets like red hair and she's all angry all the time. And sometimes she turns into like a bird headed thing. In general, the Morgan in either of those two forms has the ability to transform into flocks of crows because the crows associated with the goddess. Uh, she has the ability to summon like evil crows that like hurt people near her. She can grow crow wings to fly away herself. And of course, she has the ability to drop down into the underground whenever she wants to, although I don't know how that translates outside of London. And then the third person is Gentle Annie, who is much nicer than the other two and can heal people and things. Miles, between your choices of characters with dissociative identity disorder and Claire's choices of characters with animal sidekicks, I really feel like you guys are pushing up against some of the rules of Surprise Party when it comes to number of characters. The fifth character slot is the Claw. There's a lot of strange non-human characters out in the multiverse, and this character is one of them. They may or may not have human-level intelligence or the ability to communicate, and the range of the abilities to which they may have access is wide open. The one thing these characters all have in common is their blatant inhumanity. Claire, who is your claw? My claw is Totoro. <laughs> oh, very good. Tell us about your neighbor Totoro. Yeah, Totoro is a giant, like, fuzzy forest spirit from the movie My Neighbor Totoro, in that there's two little girls who move into a house at the edge of a forest, and sometimes this big monster shows up. He may be a little scary, but he's actually really nice. And he kind of helps them out largely when they're like afraid or upset. He kind of takes them on a fun adventure and helps make them not like sad anymore. And basically no. helps them connect to their emotions and connect to their childhood and connect to like whimsy and stuff like that. He's just a big fun loving monster. So you got a couple of cat Siths on your team now. Yeah. Miles, who is your claw? My claw is Yorick Burnison. <laughs> yeah! <laughs> of course. So uh, good. The Ian McKellen voiced armored polar we don't, bear himself. We don't talk about that movie, Dan. Sure. That movie I, doesn't I exist. Mean, Ian McKellen was not the problem with that movie, though. <laughs> no, but we still don't talk about it. <laughs> Tell us about Yorick Burnison. Yorick Burnison is an armored bear from the world of the His Dark Materials series. What that means is that he is an intelligent polar bear, basically, with his own armor that he made himself out of sky metal. He is the king of the bears on Svalbard. He is a tremendous warrior. I took the concept of the claw rather literally in this case, because he mm. has some and they fuck people up. <laughs> and he is an extremely competent warrior. Also... One of the reasons I wanted to pick him for this is because the books make a thing out of the fact that bears are not human and don't think like humans, and therefore it is actually impossible for humans to trick them. I mean, unless you're Lyra Silvertongue, but... Right, well, that, that's that's her. She was only able to trick the other bear because he was acting and thinking like a human. Sure. That's a very good choice for your claw. Megan Bob, who is your claw? The asset from The Shape of Water, the sexy fish man. <laughs> oh, nice. man. Okay, tell me about the creature from the sexy lagoon. Yeah. Uh, it's a South American god who can withstand tons of torture. More like the creature from the jacked lagoon. Yeah. He is <laughs> fond of eggs 
and also being noticed. <laughs> I don't know. What else am I supposed to say about him? I don't know. He can heal people. All right, great. We have three very different takes on the claw, which I, I think was basically ideal for that particular archetype. So I'm very happy. <laughs> And the sixth and final character slot is, of course, the Dumpus. Yes. Who can really <laughs> say why the Dumpus keeps showing up in the world? <laughs> Whether they just have a crappy stat build, worthless abilities, or a super annoying series of vocal clips from a D-grade voice actor, the Dumpus may not be your first character choice, they may not be your last character choice, <laughs> but, well, they're in your party. For whatever reason. <laughs> and, as always, the players will not be choosing their own Dumpus, but will instead be assigning a Dumpus to another player. Miles, who is Megan Bob's Dumpus? Damn it! <laughs> Aw, why? Nothing, Are you going to no give me reason. a Sucker Punch character, you jerk? No. <laughs> what are you talking about? No, actually, I had one picked out for Richie, so it's fine. Megan Bob's Dumpus is Hey Hey from Moana. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Aw, I like him! <laughs> Tell us about Hey Hey Miles. Uh, he's a chicken. And yep, uh, sure is. he just kind of wanders around in the background being stupid. He, I, I would say that he is dumb even by chicken standards. <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah. I would say he is dumb even by dumb cartoon chicken standards. <laughs> Megan Bob, who is Claire's dumpus? Uh, Bojack Horseman. Oh, no. Oh, yes. no. <laughs> Tell us about Bojack Horseman, Megan Bob. He's a sad alcoholic horse who <laughs> acts but then also doesn't act because he's too sad and alcoholic yep. and then has ill-fated relationships because he can't make good decisions oh boy that is quite the dumpest voice upon claire he's a dumpest at life he really is claire who is miles's dumpest miles's dumpest is gonna be jerry from rick and morty oh. oh man oh jerry smith that's a rough one tell us about jerry jerry is the son-in-law of the character of rick from rick and morty married to rick's daughter beth Rick is a permanent house guest in Jerry's house. Jerry thinks of himself as the patriarch of the family who's like in charge of making all the decisions, but really no one in the family respects him and kind of everyone resents him a little bit. And he tries to like be good and helpful and important, but he kind of sucks at everything and there's nothing special about him. And sometimes like you feel bad for him and you like him and you're like, oh, Jerry, you just try so hard, but you're just not good, but you still mean well. And sometimes you're just like, Jerry, shut up. <laughs> so <Yeah. laughs> he, he sucks. He really sucks. <laughs> All right. Everyone now has a party of six characters. But before you head over to the item shop to drop some gill, we're going to play a quick round of musical chairs. So each of you, please roll a D6. All right. Megan, Bob, what'd you get? A three. Claire? I got a four. And Miles? I got a one. So Megan Bob is going to be giving her fist to Claire. You get River Tam. Claire, you're going to be giving your staff to Miles. Sorry, Miles, you have Sakura from Card Captures. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Oh, no. Great. Uh, if you want, I can, like, give you a link where you can look at all her cards. And uh, see, like, you know what? Don't care. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck. And, uh, I like Sakura. I'm going to miss Sakura. And, uh, I'm gonna Miles miss is going to miss Miles is giving, indeed, his sword, Jakita Wagner, to Megan Bob. You know, Neil actually suggested that as a character, and I said, no, then I have to do research. And well, man, life has fucked me well, here. you should read Planetary, because it's great. Players, please introduce your party of fantastical freedom fighters to your adoring public. Okay. Uh, we'll start with Megan Bob. All right, so I have Kim Pachizaki. I have Captain America. I have Mary Poppins. I have Jakita Wagner. And I have the asset, the sexy fishman. And, and your jump is. Um, my jump is in. Oh, yeah. Hey, hey. All I, right. Uh, I like hey, hey. I'm delighted. Claire, your party. All right. Up front, carrying a massive buster shovel. We got the shovel knight. Behind him, we got Jack with Daxter by his side. Behind him, of course, in a tiny t-shirt and booty shorts is Wreck-It Ralph. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sporting a tail ring on one of his ears and grumbling in the back and being all, all salty. We have Totoro. I guess my staff is now River Tam. <laughs> so <laughs> we're wearing a red dress and carrying a basket of flowers is River Tam. And what would the dumpest be for seven? Uh, I don't is know. Is there one? Yuffie, maybe? Yeah, I guess. It's just Bojack. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Miles, let's hear your party. All right. So uh, I have Susanna Dean from Dark Tower. 
I have Prince Puma, the chosen one from Lucha Underground. I've got uh, two staffs in the form of the Morgan from the Wicked and the Divine and some anime person. And um, <laughs> then I have Yorick Burnison as my claw. And my dumpus is Jerry Smith from Rick and Morty. All right. And with that, let's insert our memory cards and boot this game up. <laughs> Chapter one, bombing mission. The Shinra Corporation's center of power is in the tiered city of Midgar, a circular metropolis ringed on all sides by the company's eight Mako reactors, which power the city and help Shinra maintain their economic and political stranglehold as they slowly drain the very life energy from the planet itself. Well, not if you can help it. Having captured <laughs> an enemy train, your team breaks into the reactor, intending to make your way to the main generator, plant explosive charges, and deal a massive blow to Shinra. But the corporation isn't about to make things easy for you. The reactor grounds are crawling with guards, dogs, and robots, and the main generator itself is protected by a huge and terrifying arachnid mech called Guard Scorpion. Megan Bob, who are you choosing to handle this attack on the reactor? <laughs> and how are they going to get past the enemies, plant the explosives, and safely escape? Jakita Wagner's going in, <laughs> uh, as far as I understand, incredibly capable and competent. Very, very powerful. She's going to walk in the front door and then everything she walks past, she's going to punch it. And then she's going to grab that scorpion, rip off one of its legs and then hit it in the face with it and then plant bombs in the leaf. Okay. This is her plan. It's a strategy that's worked out for her before, for sure. Claire, who is your bomber man or woman? So what you're saying is there is a large structure that needs to be destroyed or perhaps wrecked is the term <laughs> in my ears. <laughs> and, one might say. And guarding it is a large bug. Well, there's one uh -huh. person who has a history of destroying structures and fighting giant bugs, and it's Wrecker Ralph. Right, um, okay. We see when he is in the game Hero's Duty that he actually does steal a uniform of a soldier and is able to like kind of hide among them for a while, even though it's quite ill-fitting. He's going to punch out uh, a Shinra guard and put on his uniform and his giant fists are going to be hanging out. But other than that, he's going to perfectly blend in. Uh, he's going to fight his way there. <laughs> he's going to forget the bombs, but it doesn't matter because he's just going to punch the buildings until they fall over. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay. Uh, Miles, which character are you going with? Is there like a time frame on this? Like how long time do we frame? have to do this task? I mean, the longer it takes you to do it, you're going to draw attention and then you have to plant the bomb and get away. So sure. Are you thinking like days or weeks or months kind no, of thing? No, no, I don't think it'll take nearly that long uh, for Jerry to drive everybody insane. Um, <laughs> so he's going to get hired at the plant. Yeah, Jerry's going to get himself a job at the plant um, and he's just going to be the fucking worst say like four or five hours go by his first day in the job. Nobody is going to want to look at him, much less talk to him. By the time he is done alienating everyone on this complex, it will be no problem. We won't even have, probably have to tell him like that it's part of an important mission. We'll tell him that to go to the reactor and get a sandwich and we'll put like a bomb in his pocket. You know what I mean? <laughs> like like he's going to go up to the scorpion and the scorpion's going to be like, oh God, oh, I have somewhere to be. Oh, I'm so sorry. I, I just like abandoned his post and Jerry's oh, going to get it done. Because you know what? Jerry has experience with weird shit and surviving it and thriving for some reason. I wasn't expecting you to start this episode with a Hail Mary pass, Miles. Sure. <laughs> Godspeed, man. God bless Miles you Miles came to win. <laughs> yeah, dude. <laughs> Chapter two, In Search of the Man in Black. Well, turns out that even a shithole like Midgar can always get worse. You've been drawing a lot of heat from Shinra after you performed some unscheduled demolitions without first obtaining a proper permit. Moreover, rumor has it that Sephiroth a mystically empowered soldier long thought dead has reappeared and is up to some foul scheme. Intrigued, your group decides to head out of Midgar and go find some answers in Cosmo Canyon, a repository of forgotten and archaic knowledge. To do this, you'll have to travel from the eastern continent to the western continent, and it looks like your best route is to stow away on board a Shinra cargo ship. Claire, you're up first this round. This cargo ship is the only way across the ocean. So tell me who you're picking and how they managed to sneak on board or possibly forcefully take it over or however it is that you want to complete this. I think the best choice here is River. I mean, she's just going to do it. <laughs> like... <laughs> 
River's basically like a one woman army. She can go in and like do the stealth thing and through the combination of being able to sort of psychically sense people and sense where they're around and also just being really quiet, she could like sneak around and like punch people and throw them off the boat. Like not much of a problem, take away their weapons, all that kind of stuff. But I think the interesting stuff is actually going to happen kind of after that when she's taking it over and like the rest of my version of Avalanche is able to get on. Because, of course, she's going to feel connection to the actual spirit within the ship. And they're going to, like, <laughs> redecorate it. And they're going to get all these little rooms in the old containers. Aww. And they're going to have little wacky antics as they're, like, working out and, like, playing basketball on the deck of the ship. That's the part I'm more Aww. interested in. Like, her taking oh, I'm over. I'm way interested in that. Her taking over the ship is a foregone conclusion. That's very good. Miles, it's your go. I think, uh, as unlikely as it seems, I'm going to be sending Sakura on this particular mission. I have been kind of glancing over some wikis here while y'all have been talking. I'm still not entirely sure how these stupid cards work, but (laughs) there appears to be a card called the dark and one called the shadow. So I imagine that one or both of those things will help in sneaking somebody aboard something. (laughs) So I think they probably just started coming up with a list of all of the card names, like in order, and they just wrote them in pen and like (laughs) they couldn't stop. They did the shadow. Like, do we already do the dark? Like 20 go? Oh, fuck. I don't remember. Let's just keep going. Like, like, Claire, am I right about this? At least one of those would help conceal somebody. I don't remember what all these stupid cards do. Right, well, we're going to go with it. We're going to go with it. basically just playing Calvin Ball she, with Sakura she here. Has, she has, like, a lot of illusion-y things and, like, yeah, invisibility-y things. She can do that stuff, yeah. Yeah, she's got a bunch of different fucking cards to draw from. So many allies to draw from. I don't think this is going to be anything less than a piece of cake. And you certainly don't need to go into any... Any specific about who details these, about who these or, allies might be. Yeah, exercise <laughs> one, any one of them, specific yeah, knowledge. There's one called the Dark, and she has dark powers. And all right, uh, all right. Uh, then there's one called the Shadow, and she has Umbra Kinology or some shit. I don't know. Well, I'm convinced. <laughs> all right, uh, <laughs> Megan Bob. No, we're sending in our best operative, the person who has the most experience with boats and stowing away. Pacock. all right going to wander up to the boat go the wrong way for a while wander back over to the boat get in the way will a box fall on him and the box wander across the deck you know it will get into the hold of the ship these people live in a post-apocalyptic dystopian nightmare there's no food they're gonna look at that little chicken and go you know what we should do we should feed this chicken stuff so it gets bigger and then we can eat this chicken. And then he's just going to eat a bunch of stuff. And uh, then he's going to wander away, as he often does. He'd probably fall off the boat several times. People will rescue him because he looks delicious. <laughs> then they're going to lose him and not know where he is. And it's probably because he's made a bunch of friends with the rats on the ship and is hanging out down below. I will point out, uh, this is the second time in Smash Fiction history that Megan Bob has intimated that a character from Final Fantasy VII does not know what food is. <laughs> so. This is, look canon they yeah, don't i guess so man Dan, <laughs> they don't know what food is. look someone's gonna have to break it to it. square enix and it's not me chapter three the gold saucer your party makes its way to cosmo canyon where you learn that sephiroth is after the black materia a singularly powerful item that can call down an asteroid from the sky and devastate the world you're going to have to get to the temple of the ancients where the black materia is kept and stop him from getting it first but the temple of the ancients is quite a ways away And on your journey through a vast desert, you come upon a towering structure called the Gold Saucer. A popular tourist location, the Gold Saucer features rides, casinos, hotels, chocobo races, and countless other amusements. Well, if you're gonna keep chasing after Sephiroth, you might as well recharge your batteries with some minigames first, right? (laughs) But as the Gold Saucer's non-existent marketing campaign says, the Gold Saucer is for lovers. While enjoying their downtime, two members of your party end up making a connection and going out on a date. Yes! Miles, we don't have enough shipping crap on this podcast already, huh? <laughs> you had to throw Miles, in more. Miles, you're wrong! This is a part of the game, my dude. <sighs> so, Miles, tell yeah. me, which two characters decide to dive into the dating pool, where they go and what they do on their date, and how everything ends up turning out? Miles, do it to make me happy. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Here's what it's gonna be. Uh, Susanna Dean is going to form a connection with the Morgan over shared interests. Yeah! (laughs) Such as being fucking schizophrenic. Murder wives! 
this is less a date and more a polyamorous collective. Well, now, here's the thing is they go to a restaurant and they order dinner for six. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of things that could come for both characters out of this relationship. First of all, Susanna's not going to take any of the Morgan shit when it comes to being an abusive girlfriend. I think she's going to help her a long way with some character growth there, and that'll happen pretty immediately when they go out to dinner and then they follow it up with a concert and like the Morgan the whole time is trying to be all high and mighty and um, critique the person on stage for not being as good as her and be very passive aggressive about it. And Susanna is going to shut her down and like inform her of what it takes to be a decent human being. And in return, you know, maybe Jen and Landy can uh, give Susanna her legs back. Wouldn't that be great? Mm. Wow. (laughs) They have a mutual interest in in murdering the fuck out of people. I think it's going to go really well. See? That was great, Miles. Sure. Yeah. I wasn't hoping to use these characters for anything else. <laughs> <laughs> Megan Bob, who are you choosing to connect? This is going to be a real, like, opposites attract situation. So it's going to be Captain America and the asset. Oh, boy. Oh, God. <laughs> so obviously there's going to be one of those tunnel of love things and it's got water in it. They went on this mission together. Like they're together already, but then like the asset's going to get in the water and splash around. Steve's going to be like, you know what? Nobody's done like goofy shit with me since uh, Bucky and I used to just go get in dumb fights with people. I mean, you know, <laughs> necessary important fights, but also just dumb fights too. And he's going to be like, yeah, I'm fine. I'll get in the water and we'll just like hang out. And then uh, they're going to go wander around, go to the Chuck of o races, let it pet the chocobo but also not get too close because it might eat it and uh <laughs> then he's gonna go win something for the asset like i don't know what's the ff7 equivalent of a teddy bear a moogle yeah there you go win a moogle and then the asset you have to picture this guys the asset is gonna turn in with those big liquidy eyes and with that sense of like this is the most amazing thing that's ever happened to me this is such an alien world it's gonna be beautiful and then he's wow. gonna kiss him and he's going to go, oh, my God, you taste very weird like fish. That's quite a picture you painted for us, my yeah. Bob. That was very nice. Claire, which characters are you going with? Bojack Horseman. Yes. Is going on a date with Totoro. <laughs> yeah! Wow. All right. All right. Um, All right. Go ahead. So here's what happens. You know, everybody else is going off and doing stuff, and Bojack kind of gets stuck with Totoro, and he's like, ah, whatever, it's big, weird, hairy monster thing. I guess I'm taking care of this. And so they go out to dinner. Bojack starts talking, trying to, like, have a conversation with Totoro, and Totoro's just kind of, like, staring off into space. And he looks like he's listening, but he's not talking back. And Bojack starts talking about, you know, his career and how well it's going. He just got this really big movie part that he's really excited about and stuff like that. And then as, you know, time goes on, after dinner, they go out and like, they do some, like, gambling and play some cards. And Bojack, you know, teaches Totoro how to, like, do craps and stuff. And he keeps talking. And then over the course of the night, because Totoro is not saying anything back, but he's just listening. So Bojack can just, like, speak. And it comes out that, you know, Bojack, he's not really doing so great. You know, he was kind of a front. And really, he has a lot of unhappiness in his life. Like, he feel like his fame is kind of empty. And he doesn't really know if anyone actually likes him for who he is or if he actually has any talent or if he's bringing anything worthwhile to the world. And then they end up in the in the chocobo races. And as they're watching all the chocobos go, um, Bojack looks to Totoro and he's telling him, you know, it was his dream back in the day to be a racehorse. And he always wanted to go racing. And he gave up on that dream. He never actually went through with it. And then at this point, Totoro looks down at him and uh, picks him up. And he leaps into the air. And they land on the racetrack among the chocobos. And the <sighs> two of them go on a race among the chocobos and try to, like, race them. And they end up being a lot slower than the Chocobos. And Bojack is out of shape and very drunk. And (laughs) they run alongside them for a while. And then they fall behind. And then security guards chase after them. And then Totoro again picks up Bojack. And they bounce away. And they flee from the security guards. And they end up on a rooftop, just, like, looking out at the horizon. Bojack's thrown up a little bit. But he feels real good. (laughs) He feels, like, connected to a part of himself that he thought was gone. He starts laughing because he hasn't laughed in a long time. And he starts crying because he also hasn't cried in a long time. Dang, dude. Netflix, hire Claire now. (laughs) Man, this is one long game. We are going to have to start making some progress here. What disc are we on? Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and pop in disc three and see where that gets us. Oh, yikes. So uh, it looks like Sephiroth's gotten the black materia and has already called the meteor that'll wipe out all life on the planet. Man, this is getting (laughs) bleak fast. Uh, Let's see if we can get this storyline back on track. Okay, all right. This this looks promising. (laughs) Chapter four. Public execution. Oh boy, that doesn't sound good either. Uh, Okay. It looks like Shinra caught up to your party and managed to capture one of you. They've taken this character back to Midgar, where they have them strapped to a chair 
in a room that's about to fill with a deadly toxic gas. This whole thing is going to be televised to show the world what happens when you mess with Shinra. Uh, Megan Bob, quick, choose which one of your characters was captured and is seconds away from death. Tell me how they escaped the situation and how they managed to either fight or sneak their way past Shinra's guards to reunite with their friends. Uh, Mary Poppins. Okay. All right. <laughs> no, this let's, makes let's total sense. So she's trapped to a chair. So what? She can make inanimate objects move. All she has to do is sing like a happy song and all the stuff is going to be like, oh, all right. Mary Poppins is singing about how we shouldn't be tying her down. Great. Let's just undo all these buckles. And then, you know, the guards are going to be like, look really angry about stuff. And if she can melt the heart of a capitalist, she can definitely melt the heart of these stupid guards who are underpaid. So, yeah, she's just going to like sing the song and then, uh, I don't know, maybe if there's a nearby painting on the wall, jump into that. But if not that, then definitely melt the heart of those guards. All right, very good. Claire, your turn. I got one guy who's real good at this. It's going to be Jack. Okay. So, uh, Jack's been captured before, and he's been experimented on before with all sorts of weird toxic shit. He got injected with a bunch of dark eco, and that stuff's like the worst freaking poison ever. In the first game, if you touch dark eco, you instantly die. In the second game, when you touch dark eco, you get more powerful. So any <laughs> poison that they put into Jack is just gonna turn him into a giant crazy dark eco monster. He's gonna break <laughs> out of his chains, and just like purple lightning's gonna shoot out of every part of his body, and he's gonna roar and smash the entire facility as like a giant crazy rage monster okay uh, and miles let's hear what you're going with uh let me just say something anytime you think you've captured yorick bernison <laughs> um, <laughs> oh that was a mistake on their part it's because he meant to be captured <laughs> because again he he's a bear i don't know if you knew this <laughs> but he's a big fucking bear <laughs> oh really the armored bear is a bear <laughs> yeah amazingly so the way this is gonna work is that once he has allowed himself to be led into the heart of enemy territory, <laughs> he is going to snap the bonds that hold him <laughs> because he's a bear. <laughs> and then he's just going to fucking kill everybody. Gas, no gas, whatever. Ugh. Yay, bears. Chapter five, the North Cave. All right, you've managed to pick up tons of materia. You've mined game facts for every last secret. You've bred chocobos like they're going extinct. Mm. There's just one thing left, and that's confronting Sephiroth. The now godlike villain has posted up quite securely in the North Crater and waits comfortably as the meteor in the sky grows larger by the day. The time is now. Your challenge here is to get into the crater to confront this long-haired hippie before he can destroy the <laughs> world. But that means braving mile after mile of snowy frozen tundra and towering mountain peaks. Pick someone to get through this winter wasteland. You could attempt to hike through it, you could try to climb the sheer cliff faces, or you could try to grab a snowboard from the Icicle Inn and get to the final big boss fight in style. Claire, which character is going to be putting their cold weather training on display here? Uh, yeah, Shovel Knight. All right. I mean, he's your one dude left, so that makes sense. But tell us about how he gets through this. So Shovel Knight, he don't even need to go get like a snowboard or whatever. One of his relics, his magic relics, is called the Mobile Gear. And it's basically like a gear that is parallel to the ground. And then there's another gear underneath it that's perpendicular to the ground that looks like a wheel. And he stands on the first one. The second one like spins around and it's like a skateboard. It's like a motorized skateboard that he can use to cruise over hostile terrain. You can like go over spikes and stuff on it on the game. Using that, he's going to be able to just like go over all the harsh terrain um, pretty quickly. Um, if he needs to stay warm, another one of his relics is he also has a magic rod that can shoot fire. So he can use it to like make a little fire for himself to stay warm. He's been through ice levels before. He had an ice level. Ice levels are nothing. All right. Miles, it's your turn. Uh, let's see what you've got now that you used up your polar bear. <laughs> I was going to say, I kind of like wish that I hadn't, but I'm kind of <laughs> glad that I did. Because the person that's going on this quest is obviously Prince Puma. <laughs> Does he dress for the cold? Let me tell you something about Prince Puma. Uh, please. Um, because Lucha Underground is the best wrestling show, Prince Puma has in fact died and been brought back to life by necromancy. And once you've experienced the cold of death, the cold of snow really isn't going to do anything to you. Prince Puma is supernaturally capable of fucking overcoming like mundane obstacles like ice and snow. He's going to flip up to the top of the mountain, just climb, flip, cartwheel, whatever. And once he's on top, he is going to jump from the top of the mountain 
and land in the crater just from there because that's how far my dude can jump because have you seen Trevor Man wrestle? He can jump that far and he's going to land in a really awesome pose right on top of the Aztec seal that was secretly hidden there. <laughs> All right, uh, Megan Bob, how are you getting through this? Kenpachi Zaraki is not actually alive. Really? He's from the spirit world. So they can sort of feel things, but mostly not. The main thing that he feels is rage and sometimes whenever he's bleeding. <laughs> so the snow is just going to be probably annoying to him because he fight is cheerful and he doesn't appreciate that. Although the little pink person on his shoulder, Yachiru, is probably going to really enjoy that. So he'll try and keep quiet. He also spent a lot of time being homeless in the afterlife. I cannot explain how that works. Uh -huh. But he wandered around a lot wearing very little clothing and just eating twigs. And uh, it gets cold in Japan and he was fine. His kimono is very big. He'll be fine. He'll be very warm, but very unhappy. <laughs> okay. Chapter six, X-Winged Angel. Your party has overcome adversity in the form of monsters, robots, lethal weather, dystopian governments, and awkward first dates. But mm -hmm. now you hit that last save point. You use up every last Phoenix down in your inventory, restoring every character in your roster back to fighting strength, and walk into the final room to confront Sephiroth. Only, Sephiroth is gone. It turns out that, at the last moment, he was called away to participate in something called Smash Bash 1. Nah. <laughs> I guess he must have thought that was much more important than this whole destroying the world thing. I but, mean, to be fair, he's objectively correct. Correct. But he didn't leave without a contingency plan in place. You see... All those sightings of Sephiroth around the world weren't actually the silver-haired man himself. Those were all clones of his, people who had been experimented upon by having some of his cells injected into them. This procedure gives them some degree of power, yes, but it also means that they become slaves to his will. And as it turns out, there's still one more clone to contend with. Yes, it turns out that one of your party members has been a Sephiroth clone this whole time. <laughs> and now, with Sephiroth himself out of the picture, this former friend turns on all of you in a mad bid to carry on his dark destructive work. Miles, who in Megan Bob's party is a Sephiroth clone? <laughs> and now the final boss of Megan Bob's game. Yay! I mean, Mary Poppins. Okay. Nice! Megan Bob, who in Claire's party is a Sephiroth clone? I want it to be Totoro, but I don't want it to be Totoro. You heartless monster. I know, this is my problem. No, it's River Tam. It's River Tam. And Claire, who in Miles' party is a Sephiroth clone? So you got Susanna, uh, Susanna, Morgan. Susanna, Prince Puma, the Morgan, uh, Sakura, fucking Yorick, and uh, Jerry. <laughs> <laughs> I want you know it to, who it should be. I want it to be Jerry. But... <laughs> But that's not a very difficult boss. <laughs> I kind of know what's going to happen if I make it Jerry. <laughs> I mean, follow your heart, dude. I think it's going to be Jerry just because, I don't know, YOLO? <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> I find that funny. So now that you all know what you're up against, tell me how all of your characters band together to make a final stand against one of their own. Miles, go for it, because Jerry Smith is holding the Black Materia and looking to destroy the world. <laughs> Um, <laughs> uh, so I think probably the first tactic we're going to use is uh, we're going to have the Morgan turn into Bava and just like browbeat him in the way that only that redheaded incarnation of the Morgan can. So she's just going to like go off on him and just tell him that he is the worst possible specimen of manhood in history. <laughs> I don't remember the exact quotes about what she says about how tiny the dude's cocks around her are, but there are many of them. <laughs> so we'll start with that, just making him like totally insecure until he like drops his head and turns away. At which point Puma is going to flip through the air and, like, spin kick or, like, cartwheel kick the Black Materia out of his hands. Yorick is going to um, swallow the Black Materia, catch it, and swallow it. Okay. Oh, dang. And Suzanne is going to shoot him in the head. <laughs> all right. <laughs> this is all happening within the span of just a few seconds. Yeah. <laughs> One single round of combat. Yes. Okay. Uh, Megan, Bob, what do you have to say? How do you beat Mary Poppins? Okay, so at first, the answer seems obvious. 
like Kenpachi's going to come from one side and then Jakita's going to come from the other and they'll be slicing and she's going to be parrying with her umbrella and then they're like, they land a couple cuts and then they're both bleeding and it's all very dramatic. And then Steve says, no, there's a better way. And then he turns to the asset and nods and the asset just walks up and looks at her and gives the like that seductive fishy look. Because she's been, you know, Mary Poppins has been lonely. There's only that chimney sweep. He's not, <laughs> he hasn't been shown very much interest in her. Also, he's not very enterprising. So she looks at this very attractive, shiny fish man. And then while she's looking at him, he just cuts her throat. And then she falls down dead. And then from out of the shadows, Hey Hey comes over and like just pecks at her a little bit. Wow. <laughs> I was not expecting yours to get so dark. I was sure you were going for like a shipping to redemption thing, but okay. All right. Can't kill a time lord like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they don't die that way. Claire, it's all down to you. Give it to River Tam. River Tam, she starts channeling all that Sephiroth power. You know, her hair turns like solid white and uh, she starts to manifest all sorts of crazy magical powers leaping through the air getting crazy swords and nonsense and punching people. <laughs> Shovel Knight's going to do his best to fight against her. He's using his phase locket to fade in and out of reality. Um, you know, he's got like Bahamut materia in his shovel. Jack and Daxter has, I don't know, like Knights of the Round materia in his morph oh, gun. Dang. wreck Ralph has like Ifrit and Shiva, one in each fist, like punching Shit. at him. <laughs> but River's just kicking all their butts. You know, there's nothing they can do. Bojack Horseman, like throws a beer bottle at, uh, at her at one point in time, and then she looks at him and he just runs away. Um, and uh, But it's not working. River just beats him all up. And then she finally comes to face Totoro. And Totoro just looks at her with a big scowl on his face. And then she roars at her, just like, you know, super loud. And then she looks it back and she roars at him right back. And then he roars at her. And then she roars at him. She goes up and she starts just punching him. And he's just really soft and fluffy. And he's just taking all her punches. And he's just like roaring and she's roaring. And then she just stops and she just collapses to the ground and she starts crying because she just had to let all that pain out about being a Sephiroth clone. Aww. And, you know, Totoro just gave her the freedom to just be herself and let it all out and be a monster and just be angry at the world. And now she got it all out. And then Totoro gives her a big hug and she doesn't want to destroy the world anymore. And then he also eats the black materia because <laughs> <laughs> he's a hungry boy. And that black materia, man, it's real tasty. <laughs> it's the mystery flavor. You know? right. Oh my God. Okay, uh, well, tallying up the points, I see that <laughs> Miles is our winner. Nice. Yeah, really? Oh. Yes. Uh. Uh, so going through the uh, the previous rounds, round one, Megan Bob took first place. Jaquito Wagner set loose inside a Mako reactor is instant game over. Yeah. Like that is putting a game shark in your game level of cheating. Chapter two, Claire won first prize there. River, obviously very good at infiltrating, but then of course, Claire went the extra mile with talking about friendship and basketball courts, which I very much appreciated. <laughs> Miles won for chapter three with the date, which really surprised me, but I can <laughs> totally see that working. And right? I actually really liked what he did with those characters. I thought it was really nice. Chapter four, Megan Bob won first place uh, because Mary Poppins just escaping from an execution chamber and completely bamboozling all the Shinra people was maybe the best single delightful moment I've had this entire <laughs> night. Claire got first place in chapter five because Shovel Knight has so much going for him <laughs> that is just perfect for navigating a polar landscape. And then Miles, I gotta say, man... Just because, like, you beat a guy who isn't really much of a fighter Thank doesn't Claire. mean you won any <laughs> less. So maybe I should have picked Sakura. <laughs> should have picked Sakura on that one. I would have no idea how to deal with her. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought it was funny that Jerry oh. was secretly a Sephiroth clone. And I, uh, it was. It I was thought great. that would maybe come along with him having some more powers he could use, like secretly. <laughs> I but I guess not. Look, I'm sure the Black Materia multiplied his powers a thousand fold. I, right. I will say, Claire, you 100% get credit for the assist on that one. Because <laughs> Maybe I'm not approaching this with the keen tactical mind that I need to pull out a win. I mean, look, we're making a good episode here. Like, yeah, no one yeah. wins anything from this. But speaking of which, Miles, congratulations. You've <laughs> saved the planet from certain destruction and opened wide the door for innumerable sequels and spinoffs. So uh, take a moment and tell us what your characters do now that the world is safe once again. I mean, I don't know anything about Final Fantasy, unfortunately, so I can't really... <laughs> 
<laughs> like <laughs> paint you a word story about what happens in this world. So I'll just say that um, with the help of uh, Sakura's unknowable magical powers, um, <laughs> just because you don't know them, doesn't <laughs> we're going with it. Um, she helps uh, Susanna open a door back into Midworld, and uh, Susanna and uh, the Morgan return to Midworld together. You know, Puma's a solitary guy. He he just kind of wanders off into the, the distance, sure to return at the first sign that he's needed, as all true heroes do. Any rumors of some dude who looks kind of like him but doesn't wear a mask and has, like, the exact same tattoos fighting in other places should be totally discounted. Completely mm-hmm. different guy. You know, I'm going to say York actually goes with him. I think Puma and York have a... Uh, have formed a bond over the course of the battle. So York uh, kind of goes with him for a while, acts as a mercenary like he does, and eventually returns to Svalbard to be their king. You know, and Jerry's dead. So um, <laughs> thank you guys for joining me on this ridiculousness. I hope you guys had fun because oh, I totally. very much did. Oh, yeah. thanks, Dan. That's great. Time for the Chocobo thanks. Ooh, Aww. quick. Quick. Wark. Isn't that Wark? They do both. Depends on the game. Oh, my okay. God. Shut up, nerds. <laughs> Over to Twitter. Thank you to Jeffrey Ketchum, Roop Boop. That's a new person. Hi. Decade fan, cynical realist, Matias Totimez, Florian, Jake. Yeah, just Jake. Just Jake? Just Jake. <laughs> he's not a fan I mean, or real anything. That's it's changing a clone. it up. Sorry. <laughs> it's almost like he's now less than Jake. Oh. Hayden. Oh my God. Sean Boyd, cosplay devotee, Rafael Medina, cosplay fiend, Eugenia Says, Nancy Gosnell, and Jeff Rick Present. Over to Tumbles, thank you to Secretly a Skeleton, Shh, Show. Every Zig 314, Sid Rabbit Blog, Jeep Rhyme, Fat Blunt 69. Fat Blunt 69. <laughs> nice. <laughs> and Changing Shades. And on Facebook, thank you to Tom Grow, Hayden Reynolds, Daniel Kidder, and Jeffrey Ketchum. Also, big thanks to all our supporters on Patreon uh, who make numerous things possible, including our latest bonus content, which comes to us courtesy of one, Claire Mulcairn, and it's beautiful. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So I drew a picture cool. this time. I drew yeah. two pictures. Two uh, pictures. I was going to do a picture of the two Phyrexian Praetors that we've met so far in uh, the game. You Three know. now, but yeah. Well, yeah. spoilers for us. It was two at the time. Yeah, two mm-hmm. at the, it was two at the time, but it, I couldn't think of a good way to do it as one picture I wanted to do, so I did two pictures. So there's pictures I, I did character designs, and they're nice little scenes of the times when we first met them, and they're pretty, and I like yeah. them. Yeah. yeah, and if you yeah, want to see them, you should go over to patreon.com slash podcast and throw us just a little bit of money. One of them was yeah. more detailed li- and took a really long time, so look at it. So <laughs> that shit up. Seriously, they are the most t-shirt-worthy prints I've ever seen you draw, Claire. <laughs> yeah, man, they're real good. I oh, love thank them. You. As I the person that. who came up with those character ideas, I love what you did with them. <laughs> we also were recently featured on an interview on WMQComics.com. One of our fans and patrons, as it happens, Matt Laserwitz, uh, happens to write for that site. So he interviewed us on a segment called Pod Peoples. Uh, I know that he also interviewed Hub from Tighten Up the Defense and occasional episodes of Smash Fiction. Uh, But yeah, there's a two-part interview with all six of us where we talk about comics and our show and things that we like and all sorts of stuff. Just kind of gets into stuff about us. It's like another anniversary episode, but in written form. Yeah. (laughs) Finally, we have a new iTunes review. Nice. Uh, This one comes to us from Inox the Black, I want to say. But this person gives us five stars in a review titled Favorite Podcast. Well, then I'll pronounce their name however the fuck they want me to. (laughs) I mean, yes, absolutely. I have listened to over 50 episodes in the past three weeks since I Jeez, discovered this podcast. It's too much. And I am hooked. Yeah, I wonder what the record is for that so far. Anyway. You no, know, I'm going the other way on this one these days. I mean, you should be listening to more. There you go. <laughs> All right. Great. Good You're job, Miles. No, Miles, you'll kill them. Those are some irresponsible decisions. <laughs> Despite the insistence that this is, quote, less thinking, more yelling, I find that the subjects are well-researched and argued. Extraordinary League is fantastic. Also, do. Oh, oh man. No. Thank you so much to everyone for listening to this episode of Smash Metafiction. We'll be back with a regular Smash Fiction match next week. And that match is going to be Odysseus versus Kukulin versus Beowulf versus Sir Lancelot. <laughs> Smash Metafiction is produced by Miles Schneiderman and production assistant Sharon Schneiderman with logo design by Claire Mulcairn. 
Special thanks to Kevin McLeod at Incompetech.com for our theme song, Volatile Reaction. You can find us on Twitter at Smash Fic Podcast and search for the Smash Fiction Podcast on Facebook, Tumblr, and YouTube. Subscribe on Apple Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice, and if you leave us a good review, we shall become more powerful than you can possibly imagine. Smash Fiction is made possible thanks to our supporters on Patreon at patreon.com slash smashfictionpodcast. Please consider donating as little as a dollar each month. It helps us keep the show going. And we have great rewards and extra content for those who help us out. If you have any suggestions, feedback, or other contributions, send them to us at smashfictionpodcast at gmail.com and help us continue the fight. I just want to say, have we already passed the dressing up as a lady part? (laughs) Yeah, I couldn't do every scene in Midgar, I want to do the dressing up. I want to do the cross-dressing to infiltrate a brothel scene. (laughs) I know, I know. That was like the one thing I had to cut that I was like.